Hello, and welcome to video 5 of Module 2. In this video, we're going to be discussing bar graphs and a special type of a bar graph called a Pareto chart. Let's get started. A bar graph is a way of presenting how often values occur in a data set, where the height of each bar indicates how often each value occurs in the data set. Now, what's nice about a bar graph is that you can make it for either qualitative or quantitative data. What's not so nice about a bar graph is that in order to make it, you have to have some sort of frequency table going first. So this could be a frequency distribution, a relative frequency distribution, or something similar to that. So let's jump right on into an example of creating a bar graph. For this example, the number of bars per 10,000 workers were measured for 10 metro areas and recorded in the table to the left. We've been asked to make a bar graph for this data. In this case, our frequency values are per 10,000 workers to make it easier to compare the 10 cities. Alright, so first I have to give myself some space to make my bar graph. Now, if you don't have any graph paper but you want to have a grid to be able to make your bar graph on, there are a couple things that you can do. One option is just to do a Google image search for graph paper and you'll get tons of different options. What I do when I don't have any graph paper is I take two sheets of loose leaf and I turn one of them sideways so that the lines are vertical and I put it underneath the other sheet of loose leaf. And the vertical lines show through enough so that there is a good enough grid for me to be able to make my graph. The first thing I'm going to do for my bar graph is to give it a title. So I've decided to title my graph bars in metro regions. Now, it doesn't really matter when you write the title on your graph, you can do this at the beginning or at the end, but I tend to forget it if I leave it towards the end. So my preference is usually to give my graph a title right away just so I don't forget it. Next, we're gonna have to label the vertical axis. Our vertical axis should always start at zero on the bottom, and then we have to figure out how high up it needs to go. To do that, I'm going to look in the frequency column, or the number of bars per 10,000 workers, of my table and find the highest value. In this case, it's 8.34, so I need to make sure that my vertical axis goes up to at least 8.34. I think in this case, if I count each of my lines as one, I'm going to have enough space. But I'm not going to label every line, I'm just going to label every other line. Then, I want to make sure that I label my vertical axis. So this was the number of bars per 10,000 workers. All right, now comes the fun part. We get to make the bars for our bar graph. The first city in our table is Buffalo, New York, which has 6.68 bars per 10,000 workers. Because I don't have a whole number here, because it's a decimal, I'm going to have to approximate the height of the bar when I go to the graph. So to create the bar for Buffalo, New York, I'm gonna go a little bit higher than halfway between the six and seven lines. So that's gonna be yeah, about here. In this case, we're not looking for a perfect exact value for this height to go, we just wanna give it a good estimate. Since 0.68 is more than 0.5, I knew that this line should go a little bit higher than halfway between. Then I'm gonna draw the left and right hand sides of the bars connecting them to the horizontal axis and I'll label this with Buffalo, New York. That's all you have to do to create the bars. So I'm going to skip a space, and next I'm gonna do the bar for Cleveland, Ohio. As before, I've got a decimal, it's 4.66. And also like before, 0.66 is gonna be a little bit more than a half. So when I draw the height of the bar for Cleveland, Ohio, I want it to be a little bit more than halfway between the four and the five. Then I connect it down to the horizontal axis, and I label it with Cleveland, Ohio. If you'd like to pause the video here, you can go ahead and do that and create your bar graph. Once you've finished, unpause the video and we can check to see if we get the same thing. All right, so let's finish drawing the bars for our bar graph. Once we're all done drawing the bars, now I can label the horizontal axis with metro area. I like to leave the label for this till the end because notice how some of the names of these cities are quite long and I'm not quite sure how far down they're going to go. So in order to prevent the names of the cities from interfering with the title of my axis, that's why I like to label it at the end. Just make sure you don't forget to label it. Now, if all you're asked to do is to create a bar graph, this is sufficient. This is sort of the minimum requirement for a bar graph. 
you've got the bars going up to the heights or approximate heights of each of the values, and you've skipped a space in between each of the bars. Your axes are labeled, and you've got a title for your graph. However, there are two things that you can do to make your graph a little bit easier to read and to stand out a little bit better. Especially if you're using a pencil on black graph lines, it can be difficult to see where the bar graphs start and where they end. So one embellishment that you can do is to shade in the bars of your graph, like so. This makes the bars pop a little bit, so it's a little bit easier to see them. And if you want to get super fancy, you could color them or you could use a different shading technique for each bar. The world is your oyster, right? Now, the second embellishment that you can do to your graph, I actually very strongly recommend for this graph. And that is to give a label to each of the bars indicating their height. Because we had to estimate the heights of the bars in our graph, if I didn't have that table there, I wouldn't know exactly how tall each bar was. So if I want the person who's going to be looking at my bar graph to know or to be able to measure more precisely, I could just add a label to the top of each bar indicating how tall it actually is. If I'm presenting both the bar graph and the data table together, then I don't really need to do this. But if I'm just giving the bar graph, in this case it would be nice to do. If all of my bars were even numbers, like instead of 6.32, it was just a 6, then I also wouldn't necessarily need to label the heights of the bars. Alright, so that's all you have to do in order to make a bar graph. Now when we made the bars for a bar graph, we just went in order of the cities in the table, and it looks like the table is in alphabetical order. Because these values are qualitative, I really could have done the bars in any order. It doesn't really matter. So I could have organized the bars instead, going from their highest frequency to their lowest, or from the lowest frequency to the highest, or any other sort of order that seemed appropriate. When you make a bar graph so that your bars are organized from highest to lowest, we call that a Pareto chart. The Pareto chart is named after an Italian economist, sociologist, and philosopher by the name of Vilfredo Pareto. While Pareto made lots of significant contributions to a wide variety of disciplines, he's most well known perhaps for being an economist. And that's where we find the origins of the Pareto distribution. All right, so let's make a Pareto chart. In this example, we've been given the top eight movies of all time on RottenTomatoes.com from February of 2016. We've been asked to make a Pareto chart for the number of reviews for each film. Now notice that this table has three columns. It has rank, title of the movie, and the number of reviews. For our Pareto chart, we're only going to be using the second two columns. We're going to be organizing each of the titles based on how many reviews they received on RottenTomatoes.com. In order to get started, I have to move this out of the way so that we have room for our grid. Now, as with a regular bar graph, you want to make sure that you label your vertical axis appropriately. We'll always start at zero, but I need to figure out how high it needs to go. To do that, I need to figure out what film had the most reviews and how many reviews did it get. So looking at our table, it looks like ET got the most number of reviews, with 112. So when I make my vertical axis, I need to make sure that it goes up to 112. I think I can do that if I label my axes by tens. Perfect, I get to 120, so I've got enough space. Next, I want to label my vertical axis, so this is number of reviews, so I'm just going to label it number of reviews. Then, so I don't forget it later, I want to make sure that my Pareto chart is going to have a title. So I'm going to title this thing, Reviews for Top 8 Movies. Next, we're going to make a bar graph almost like we did before. The difference is we can't just use the categories in the order that they appear in the table. We have to organize them in terms of number of reviews. Since ET had the most number of reviews, that has to be the first bar that we draw. Since it's at 112, I want to draw the top of the bar just above 110. And so that it stands out, I'm going to shade in my bars on this graph. For the second bar, we go to the film that had the second highest number of reviews. And in this case, that's going to be The Wizard of Oz with 108. 108 is just below 110, so I draw the bar accordingly. And then the third film is going to be The Godfather with 84 reviews, and so on. So if you'd like to pause the video here, I'd recommend that you do that and complete your Pareto chart. And when you've completed, you can unpause the video and we can check our answers. 
All right, so let's see how we did. All right, and we're almost done. The last thing we have to do is make sure we label our horizontal axis. In this case, these were titles of films, so I'm gonna call this movie title. Now, I'll point out this graph that we made is actually a little bit misleading. Because it's titled Reviews for Top 8 Movies, I might be led to believe that this is showing us which films were most highly reviewed compared to those who were not reviewed very highly. In that case, I would think that E.T. was the top rated movie, followed by The Wizard of Oz, The Godfather, The Third Man, and so on. However, that's not what this graph is representing. And that's why that vertical axis label is important, because if I look at that label, I know now that this is not a ranking of the films. It's just how many reviews it received on the website. And those reviews could be good, or they could be bad. And in fact, E.T. is not the top ranked movie in the top eight. It's actually the eighth one. So just be careful when you're looking at graphs to make sure you understand what the graph is displaying. And be careful when you're creating graphs to make sure that it is accurate to what you're hoping to portray. In this case, creating a Pareto chart based on the number of reviews doesn't really make a lot of sense to do. But I wanted to make this graph so we could talk about that and, and whether or not it's appropriate. All right, so that's it for our video on bar graphs and Pareto charts. In the next video, we're going to make a very specific type of bar graph called a histogram. And a histogram's a little bit different from bar graphs in that there's no space in between the bars and it is most appropriately used for grouped data. However, you can make a histogram for ungrouped data, which is what we'll be doing in the next video. Thanks for watching and I hope you have a great day.